Durga, J J Ma, you sing. Hey Ma Durga, Hey Ma Durga, Hey Ma Durga, J J Ma. Then I sing. Hey Ma Durga, Hey Ma Durga, Hey Ma Durga, J J. J ma, J 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 J ma. Ooh, awesome. Okay, we're gonna put it all together. And uh, since I brought my harmonium. I felt guilty because I didn't use the Diddy bike system this morning, but I couldn't figure out. Let's sing together. Hey ma doga, hey ma doga, hey ma doga, J J ma sing with me. Hey ma doga. Hey, Madoga. Hey, Madoga. J J Ma. Hey, Madoga. Hey, Madoga. Hey, Madoga. J J Ma. Hey, Madoga. Hey, Madoga. Hey, Madoga. J J Ma. 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 J Ma. So then they all look at me kind of like they're crazy. So I let them know that. 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea was originally not just a science fiction episodic piece that was published in a periodical in the uh, eight, uh, 1860s, uh, but that originally it was a political piece and that Jules Verne was responding to the oppression that he saw in the world then with colonialism, but the publisher didn't think that he, they could sell any magazines with that, so he pulled that out. But then at the end of his life, he, he wrote one final story, The, the uh, uh, Mis Mysterious Island, and if you get through to the end of that, there's this little cave and the adventurers go into the cave and they find this old hermit and the hermit turns around and it's Captain Nemo. And they ask, Nemo, where have you been? He says, well, I've been hiding here. He said, well, we, we've all wondered who, who you are. And he explained, well, I was an Indian king and my family and I led the Sepoy Mutiny of 1857 and they were all lost, so I spent my life trying to create a world that I didn't see on the surface, an egalitarian world, a world where everybody would be treated as an equal. So I got excited about that, being from an ensemble theater company, 
And I also got excited about that because now I understood the wants and needs of my protagonist and I could work to create a piece that is episodic in its original form, but try to apply a dramatic arc. And so that, that is, uh, in a nutshell, the exact same thing that folks at Looking Glass have been doing since we started. Taking works that are forgotten, pulling them off the shelf, dusting them off, and seeing if how those works can speak to us today. How do we bring out why this story must be told in the here and now? And there's a wonderful cross-section there, because early on we found that by doing that, we could bring audience in, because oftentimes the books that we were really interested in were on the reading lists of the local schools. So our first paid gigs were bringing in students during the day to see our work. They weren't necessarily stylistically something the students were expecting to see, but I think ultimately that was, that was a good thing. And it shocked them and made them come see the jungle or, or the other works that we were doing. We were awful waiters at Looking Glass. We were horrible at it. So we had to figure out how to fund our art. And many of us came from educational backgrounds. And it was a natural way to uh, fund our art. But also, we found it was a natural place to put our artistry out into the world and it, it felt like a good match. So really from the beginning, Looking Glass has been uh, fully, has fully gained purchase in a university setting. We really never left. Many of us are from, we're from all over the the planet, but we came here to Chicago to go to school together uh, up at Northwestern University. And it's up in Evanston, which is without traffic, 30 minutes again that way, um, unless you're studying law or medicine, and then it's 10 minutes that way. No, that way still. So for me, as a company member of a ensemble that is about to push 30, trying to figure out how to remain an ensemble and grow as individuals and help other artists grow their ensembles and hand over core values and principles and styles and our fetishes over to a, a, a new generation has, has been the crux right now for, for all of us. We feel ourselves becoming the large institutions that we were railing against when we first fell in Chicago, changed, charged, and empowered. And so that is, we are firmly sitting in that place right now and trying to figure out what to do. So in a way, I'm talking about sitting in a university and what that means for ensemble, but I'm also right now about to take the findings from what we did up at Lake Forest and bring it back to my ensemble. We have our artistic retreat coming up in August. And they're going to be wondering, you're seeing this stuff before they are, many of them. Because we're all, we, everyone flies in in August and we sit in a room for a week and lock the doors and when the black and white smoke comes up we have a season and 
So, and we still do this quixotic process, but the pressures are immense. And so we're trying to find different ways of creating our art, remaining an ensemble, but that has different definitions for different members of the ensemble. Not just different definitions for other ensembles, but even within our ensemble, what it means to be ensemble is vastly disputed. So that's kind of what we're talking about today. All, the, all those things. I couldn't figure out how to put that in a, in a byline, so that's, that's what we're doing here today. Okay, so once again, I'm David Kersner. Uh, I am a founding ensemble member of Looking Glass. I was the first artistic director. I direct, I act, I write, I teach, all, all that good stuff like all of you do. Here's my core values and our company's core values. We start with invention. Whenever you see a looking glass show, there is something invented or reinvented. The joke about looking glass is we're really good at reinventing the wheel, but you could go down the street and buy one used and it works really well. But we like to figure out a way to reinvent roundness. We still believe in collaboration. Collaboration with fellow ensemble members, collaboration with invited artists, collaboration with our design team, collaboration with our community, parents in our education programs. We even collaborate with our board. Uh, it was easier before when we were the board, and so it was no big deal to have the board in the room. But now that we have community members coming in as, as our board, they're finding that relationship and getting them excited and finding the buy-in in the inventing that we're trying to do is a big part of who we are. Our, our goal has always been to figure out why this story must be told and oftentimes if we go back to our third core value of transformation, that's usually where we find it. How can telling this story, how can putting this story into the world heal somebody, bring new populations into the theater to feel the healing power of theater, to feel the catharsis, to feel the purge, and to invent, going back to the first word, new ways of making that happen. We were last night at dinner talking about is, is Arist has Aristotle, is, is, it, is that still it? Is that still the way that we need to make things happen? Can we mix it up? Or is it look mixed up, but then when you put the Rubik's Cube back, is it still that same dramatic arc? And that's what we continue to grapple with. Okay, so this is normally, or, or, or what, this is, this is the story that we tell people, right? This is a show that I directed 2001, La Luna Muda, was conceived and directed by moi, inspired by Italo Calvino's The Distance of the Moon. Now, I, I, I do get the, the credit as the conceiver, but I conceived it with those five folks. These are company members. Laura Eason, David Catlin, Larry DeStasi, Tony Hernandez, and down below, Heidi Stillman, our current artistic director. And more often than not, this is how we create. We have company members, and we're working together, and we had three months of workshops, and some illegal rehearsals that Union didn't know about, and then we had our three weeks of rehearsals. Everybody had to maintain the same weight during that entire time because as you can see that they are counterbalancing each other. So we all ate together and made sure that everybody was... And this, and this is, this probably, you probably recognize this. This is the best idea in the room was coming from this group. 
And when I would see someone try something like taking that straight ladder and sticking it upright 90 degrees into the middle of that curved ladder, and it suddenly looked like a ship, we, were, we wanted to make that happen. We didn't know how we could make it balance, but we knew that that was a really great idea. And so suddenly we knew what we were doing for the next eight hours. Coming out of that play, coming out of the trust that any one of those people could direct the show, but they had, in the previous artistic retreat, given me the reins. And so I was the guide. I was the side coach. I was the mentor for all of these folks that most likely have higher IQs than myself. And so I knew how to use them. And they trusted me to be used 90% of the time. Right, there's that 10% where everybody is frustrated. It's usually during tech. We can't get this thing to balance. Well, you're the director. You tell us whether we're going to cut it or not. Try it one more time. <laughs> then you got that. So what behind them was a two-dimensional image of the moon. And I don't know if you can see from this picture, there's rods coming out of it. So we're not spending a lot of time on this show. But they climb up on the moon, and they do lots of circus tricks on that moon. And that moon is at, um, this was before we had our theater at the Water Tower Pumping Station. This is at the Ruth Page Theater, which is an old moose lodge. So it's 80 feet deep. So we cantilevered the moon all the way from the backstage, and it came at the audience 40 feet towards them. So you got the, the fun of the moon getting bigger and bigger. And the moon was also an ensemble member in the show. It, it, was, it had its wants and needs. There was things it was willing to do, and there was things that it did not give consent to. So that's, that's, that is how we work but it is also the story of we tell of how we work. It's not always the way we work because we don't all live in Chicago anymore. Or we do, but we all have kids and, and we have careers. We're moving out as a universe and expanding. And so we're trying to figure out how to maintain the ensemble aesthetic within the creation process. So part of that also happens to be the other way we work, which is because we were all educators, as many of you are, we spend time in universities. Now, this isn't, this is going to be the no dull moment where you probably all walk over to the next one because like, well, we all develop in universities. That's why we're here. What I want to get at is, does that help us as an ensemble? We've been doing it since the beginning. The first show we did was Through the Looking Glass. I directed it. It was in the Shanley Shack, which was where they kept the gardening equipment at Northwestern. And so you would, at that time, I think it's now permanently cleared out, but you used to have to clear it out, put it around the back, do a show, and then put it back in. Uh, and that was, there's young versions of all the looking glass folks in their skivvies. And that's, of course, our namesake production. Uh, it happened because Richard Christensen went to see, one, see the production, and then there was a typographical error where they put the looking glass together, and our, that's why our name is Looking Glass. It, that's it. We also did Stephen Burkhoff's West at uh, Northwestern University in 1988 and then brought it to what used to be the theater building, which is now stage 773. Uh, lots of bat flips and wall flips. The 
we, we, we were getting really excited about doing it ourselves and figuring out how we don't need flying by four, we're gonna just fly through the air, we're gonna teach ourselves to fly. Mary Zimmerman was getting her, uh, uh, gra doing her graduate work at Northwestern at the same time. So we were watching her shows. And this is where we really started getting into the thing that theater people do. We're a band of thieves, right? We steal from other art forms. So we just flat out said to Mary, we want to steal your show. Will you come direct the Odyssey with, with us? Of course, that, sh that, that show, um, there's, many, there's many critics who, who claim that they saw that show. I guarantee they didn't because usually there are about five people in the audience and two of them were our boyfriends and girlfriends. So I don't think they saw that. But they went on to have another life. What did get a lot of notice was Mary Zimmerman's Six Myths which started at Northwestern University. We were, as usual, in 1997, having some financial difficulties, and we were gonna vote whether we would take the fall off. I didn't think that was gonna be a good idea, so I asked Mary to expand Metamorphosis and turn it into a, a big old show. And she did. It was supposed to run for five weeks. She wanted to have water on stage. They, they had flooded the Barber Theater at Northwestern, so we had to figure out how to do it better. Uh, I tried to hire a production manager who could do it better. She couldn't, so she stepped out of the way, and I learned how to design pool and filtration systems and pumping systems. And it ran for nine months and then went on to uh, all the way to New York City, second stage, and, and then to, to Broadway from there. And it was, it was a joy to see something, right, that was the dream. It, we, we saw her playing with it at, at Northwestern University, brought it, continued to grow it, and then it had another life, and then there it is playing in, New York City in 2001 and doing that thing that we wanted theater to do. It was playing there and it was there for those that needed healing. And it spoke, it spoke to them at that time. Christine Dunford who spoke at the opening keynote uh, directed the Jan Pataki manuscript found at Saragossa. The picture doesn't do it justice. It kind of looks like a skateboard ramp on one side that's outside of the picture there, and there's lots of things that fly in. And so this was originally done at Northwestern. I think there was a dirt floor in that. And so the great thing about testing things out in universities is you could try some really bad ideas and, and then pretend they didn't happen. <laughs> My problem is, well, where does that leave the university? Right, is, that, is, that, is that experimentation serving them or are they getting the short end of the stick? Are you truly present when you are developing a university or are you focused in one area, script development? And, and trying out some other things with student designers, but are you really trying to get the ship to port? That's my question. Are, are we fully treating this as if this is big girl art, right? This is adult stuff. We are really trying to make something that is going to change the world. That's my question. How do we make sure that we stay present? That this isn't a means to an end, but this is it. We're making art right now. I remember Bruce Norris when we first did Arabian Nights, 92. And it was, it was 
the audiences were coming. We was no longer our boyfriends and our girlfriends. There was the people were coming to see the show. And we moved it to the old Remains Theater, which is now the Bed Bath and Beyond parking lot that I was telling some folks last night. I can give you a tour if you want. And it was a gorgeous, amazing theater with couches and an amazing bar. And we got to move it there. And we were doing eight shows a week. And I remember we were absolutely exhausted and had never experienced what it meant to do four shows in a weekend. And Bruce Norris, who was playing music in the cast, he was playing that harmonium, he said, what are you guys bitching about? This is it. This is what we are all trying to do, right? Why are you? And it just made me think about, you never know when the moment is. That moment could happen in Remains Theater. That moment could happen in a black box theater or a classroom in the university. Why not treat every artistic moment as the moment? Because it might be the, you're not in control whether it's the moment. That might be the moment. That might have been my moment, right, back in 92. I still looked like this, so. Eva Barr has been working on this. Uh, if you know Eva Barr, she lives in Minnesota. She runs a CSA farm up there. She's completely off the grid. She's Athena, absolute goddess, and she comes here to, to do shows with her company. So she's been working on independent people, this Icelandic epic. She did a version of it in, um, at Carleton College. Shadow puppetry, helping tell this, this, this story of a, a, a family imploding over decades. What I'm sad about is very few of our ensemble got to experience the realized version. They didn't get to see this. Well, they saw this picture, but they didn't get to see what this, what this picture is trying to capture. So is it serving the ensemble to say, go, go experiment over there and then come back with something finished? Is that serving Eva? Is that, is that keeping her respected within the ensemble? I see some heads going like this, so I'm, I must be hitting something. So David Catlin probably, I imagine, is maybe where all of you may have connected with Looking Glass, because he directed our Looking Glass Alice, which has toured a lot, and it tours well. It's five people, but it looks like 25 people. And... Uh, so he's, he's done some other work. Uh, he did a version of Little Prince that originally was at Northwestern, 2012, I believe. If I got that slide right. Uh, very physical, using this, this uh, page that was drawn on as, as the uh, aviator does in the story. and then was uh, brought to, down to Looking Glass at the Water Tower Pumping Station. Very, uh, I would say in a way, this production looked the most like its, its original realization at Northwestern. I would say that the, the, we brought in, um, there's a strong design program at MF, MFA design program at, at Northwestern. And David, his thing is, the people in the room are the ensemble. So he, he we, we tend to have this loyalty thing going on at Looking Glass, and that, so whoever is in the room, that's who you're loyal to. So he tends to bring artists into the fold. So we have a lot of MFA students that I've been able to teach text analysis, and he's working with in collaboration classes, and then he's inviting them to design for him. And then they're coming to Looking Glass. So that, 
That's interesting, right? Because the good news about that is we get new blood, new excitement, new experimentation. The interesting news about that is, well, what about the designers that have been keeping the home fires burning at Looking Glass? What, is, what about that? I say that question without, it's, it's a non-rhetorical question. I'm, I'm curious about that. David recently did Moby Dick. We received a, a, a grant to, well, three companies did, Blair Thomas, the House Theater, and Looking Glass received a grant to each do their take on Moby Dick. And so this was his take on Moby Dick that he originally did at Northwestern and then brought to our theater. Looking Glass tends to, because we only do three shows a year, maybe we usually do a fourth bring back, like a dance company. We, uh, originally that was because our audiences were so small, no one saw it the original run, so we bring it back. Uh, I, I still feel that the, oftentimes what happens is we will perform it here and then take it on uh, tour or co-production with other companies, such as your companies out there. Last act of Lilka Caddison was a, a original piece that, that I co-wrote. There were some toy theater sequences that I developed while at Northwestern doing my graduate work. And then also I, since Rebecca Gilliman was teaching in the, uh, the MFA writing program, I snuck into class over there and she helped me with a script. So then we come to 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. This is a show that we just finished doing at Lake Forest. The goal was to create an immersive world where the audience felt like they were on the ship. For those that know the work, we did not depict getting onto the ship, and we did not depict the final Denyama leaving the ship on the deserted island. Everything occurred on the ship. We were playing around with interactive technologies. Uh, what the school didn't have in terms of seasoned performers, for whatever reason, they had invested in a lot of equipment. Um, for anybody who's been up to Lake Forest College, they actually don't have a theater. What they, they've converted an old cafeteria, Hickson Hall, so it feels like you're performing in Harry Potter, right? except a small version of it. So the shop is the old kitchen, and the theater is, is, is the old hall. So what we did was we turned that hall into a ship with back projections and front projections and interactive audio equipment. So you can see here the audience is in and around, and that, that is the footprint of the entire theater, including the house. We created a focal point, but there was also action on ladders right next to the audience, in the audience, in the aisles. Even though th that it has a quasi-thrust design, everyone is able to see the same images. And that's something when you're obviously dealing with a two-dimensional art that you, you need to make sure you take into account. So the idea was to, again, make the audience feel like they were on the ship and that they had a say, that they had some agency in how the story would progress. And so we would have screens that would come in that would ch change place when we were outside of the ship in the water, under the water. But then it would open up to uh, depict the ship. We also were playing with uh, clock punk technology and playing around with that Jules Verne created a world that was 
uh, colonial Victorian times, but also in the future. So we incorporated that, that clock punk style into, into the costume design. The underwater, one, one of the issues is when you, when you put on a diving suit, it's really hard to see people's mouths move. And like, so we were playing around with how do we communicate physically in and around that. So we played around with interactive video in using Kinex technology, this, uh, the famous organ on the ship. We, it ended up being cut once we got into uh, the performances, but it was really cool and it was one of those, it was one of those moments where in a university setting where you only have three hours with your students, and limited tech time, some decisions had to be made. And so that, that's an interesting, the culture of creating art in a university setting, there's just, there's just a different buy-in. These are students that you're gonna be grading their papers later that night. Can you truly ask them to stay, to put in the kind of hours that are required to get something like this to happen? So for those not familiar with Connects technology, uh, the woman playing Erin Axe, and we'll talk about the fact that she's a woman in a second, she walks up to the, to the organ, and the actor happens to be an accomplished pianist, and so she was able to walk up and play at a certain point. It just wasn't reliable. Someday. In order to immerse ourselves in the water, you could see that the, the screen that was pulled in front was actually scrim, so we could front project, put people in the water, do images with the back projection so you can, the actors can emerge in the, in the water, in, either in front or behind the screens. Here, Captain Nemo is attacking a very blurry sea spider made up by two ensemble members who are wearing uh, LED lighting with that squiggles through. I should have shown you a picture of sea spiders. They actually look just like that, except not blurry. Now here's what we do with the interactive audio that was soups interesting for any geeks like me in the audience. We had, you can see in front of her, there's a chaosolator pad. So a chaosolator uh, can take samples. It uh, can send MIDI information, you can hook it up with lights, you can hook it up with video. Uh, it, it is an instrument. It's, it's just a, 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 a digitally rendered instrument. And you can, what was interesting was in order to do that piano image before we had someone playing different, they were playing a, a keyboard on a chaosolator, but a chaosolator is set up like a grid it's kind of like the chess, that game that Spock plays, right? It's like a three, so it's, it's a keyboard, but you're doing this weird stuff to make it. So we deconstructed a keyboard in order to, she basically played Bach on the, the organ. So it was interesting that part of me just wanted to go get a Hammond organ and just put it back up there and just do it that way. But it was interesting to deconstruct it and put it back together. And what happened was, and that the, I can't capture this in, in pictures, the audience got to see one ensemble member creating the sound in a way that was live. It wasn't just hitting a sample. They were doing something that was, was amazing. And, but they were supporting, through Foley effect, what was happening on, on the image. So was, in a way, this, this one moment to me was the greatest success of the entire production of what we were trying to do in terms of ensemble aesthetic, in terms of pushing the envelope. We also, the one thing that in terms of training that I'm most proud of is we spent a lot of time with fight choreography. They had uh, they, they do not have any kind of certification at Lake Forest College. They're not, normally if you're working with a BFA program, you get, you get to work with some students that at least have some just basic uh, prerequisite training. And 
they had none. So we, that was the one area where we just, for the sake of safety, that's where we spend a majority of our time on the fight choreography, on the action choreography, making sure that it was, it was safe. And in a way, that also felt like a, a check in the positive side towards ensemble training, them working together. There's people without cuts and bruises and all their fingers and toes at the end of a show is the best outcome evaluation that one can have. They worked together. They're alive. So this is the part where I feel the most guilty because I feel like, are we using our students as guinea pigs? Are, are they, yeah, I, I thank, we, we thank them in, the, in the, the thank you part in the programs, but what, what are we saying to them that we are taking their work and we're putting it up on our, on our theater? It's, it's something I think about, and it's something that I, I, I want to create. Mm. I'm looking to create maybe some, uh, a rider to our bylaws in terms of how we treat our collaborators and what, so that there's full disclosure in terms of what's going to happen. I think a, a young 19-year-old, 20-year-old is, of course, they're thrilled when they come and see it open and, and they feel a sense of connection. I just feel that there's something that we need to do as ensembles to just voice that this is occurring. Ensembles are circles. We look in, and then we turn the circle, and we look out. What does that mean? What does that mean when we're saying, hey, thank you for helping make our circle stronger and stay where you are? So one of those things where stay where you are is we develop scripts within a university setting. In order to, in my mind, bring 20,000 leagues from the 19th century into the 21st century, we have to take a look at what is truly an egalitarian society. What does it mean to be equal? And when we're depicting a world where there's a single gender in that world and we're depicting that, it, it just, it, it feels disingenuous to me. So I was reading, I was reading some of George Eliot's work and I'm embarrassed to say that it wasn't until a few years ago that I knew that George Eliot was not George Eliot. I just, I keep a lot of stuff up here, but that's just not something that it just, somehow that got past me. So luckily, I learned about it in the, I went to grad school and I learned about it. And it stuck with me a decade later that, wait a minute, if, can Aranax be dealing with the same problem? Can Aranax, in order to function as a marine biologist within the academy, can she also be cloaking? And so that's, that's a, um, a bit of violence that we added to the, the original, that we put upon the original source text. That she is, in order to function within a greater society, she had to hide her identity. But then not only is she grappling with wanting to leave the imprisonment of the ship, she's grappling with the fact that when she's found out that she is, in fact, a, a biological woman by the others, that she's accepted on the ship, that it's no big deal, that she's actually able to do what she does best and discover who she really is. The issue with that is how do we make that not just a, um, I don't know, a little feel-good dart that you're putting on there. How do you really connect that to the entire dramatic arc? How do you stretch that through 
the original source text. I was uncomfortable, if you know the story, that Aranax kept a, 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 a cabin boy, a servant, an indentured servant, a slave. It's a Flemish boy, so at least there was a, it's a, it's a different kind of slave than we're used to hearing about, but it was a slave nonetheless. So I, I excised that from the, the script. But then I realized that I had taken away my, and I consider Ernax the protagonist in more recent versions, I had taken away the protagonist's flaw. There was, she, was, she was perfect in every way. So having her discover the sociopolitical rightness or wrongness of her choices in how she's able to function. Now, Conseil was able to protect her in, in the world. But then on the ship, he took on a different function. And he became her equal. And so that was a, another mm, revision of the, of, the, of the original source text. We brought Conseil back, and it became a very moving when Conseil decides to stay on the ship at the end, where Aranax leaves. Relationships in Dramatic Arc were very much applied within this episodic tale. I cannot stress this enough. The storytelling has to function as a theatrical piece. And so using the university setting to make sure that it, that it works despite nascent or beginning acting, despite limited virtuosic skills, it, it has to work in the university production. You have to make it with the building blocks that you have there, you have to make it work. And so because of that, I would put that on the I would put another check on the success column in terms of trying to tell the story with what you have and making sure that the script is doing that for you. Okay, so I want to make sure that we have time for some questions or, um, and one more demonstrational. So here's what's worked for Looking Glass. We, we got to get started on the audiovisual development, but I feel like we since we are depicting tips of icebergs, I get to use this, overuse this metaphor, we literally were just seeing the start of what we can do. I very much believe, and I got myself in trouble in a panel discussion that happened here a year ago, where I very much believe that for those that are looking for affordable theatrical venues, we're all carrying one. That, and this isn't just giving up, that there is a time and a place for the use of social technologies. And the, because of current interactive functionality, that it is a live space. And I just call on us as ensembles to invent and grow and bring in this ensemble member. That just like my moon, this is an ensemble member. And this is something that I, I try to advocate for in our, in our production. I feel like the best ideas in the room from our living ensemble members may have overwhelmed this ensemble member at this, at this point. I think there's a lot more inventing and that needs to happen and hopefully will happen. We were able to, on a limited level, work on choreographic style creation, but because we're dealing, because we don't have the physical trust in the room, 
that, that's an area that I feel we need to develop. We need to have an understanding with the universities that we're working with in terms of what, what is the training, what are the prerequisites, what are, tho what are those student bodies, those cohorts bringing into the room and how can you, as a leader, as a guide, make those limited abilities right? Make those limited abilities help you tell your story. We talked about script development. I'm back writing now. I learned some things, but we're doing some serious rewrites from this. So the, the I would have to say this production is going, to, is going to be in the category of it's going to look very different from the, the uh, university production. At least it's going to sound different. I actually think it might look very similar. The design was successful and felt interactive. The audience felt like they were on the ship. Now here's that, that positive thing. We got the exposure to new artists. Nathan Rohrer is a fantastic costume designer. Brian Healy just is new to Chicago. Amazing designer. They created some amazing stuff, and I would love to work with them. And so I'm going to be faced with the sort of moral dilemma of am I going to honor the, the work that Brian did, or am I going to honor the fact that I smoked pot with John Musial in 1987, you know? Which, which, which are we going to honor? I think that the students obviously were thrilled to work in a professional manner, to work with professional artists, to, to try on what it feels like to be within a tried and true production process, creation process and see, and see that I am not going to give them all the answers and I am going to treat them as if I trust them to make choices. And that took a long time. That's a tough one because we, if we are, if we are training artists to fulfill visions outside of themselves, because that's sometimes your job, that's one kind of software. And it requires a different kind of software to ask them to be creating artists. I don't know if human beings are, are we naturally our own leaders or are we naturally followers? The games we play say both. And so it's, 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 it, it is our job as guides to let them know which game we're playing. Are we playing the leading game or the following game? All the exercises I did with the students, we do with our our own group. I, I didn't adjust that in any way. I treated the room of adults, young adults, like adults. In order to do that, this is where we have to be advocates. And I know you all know this because when you're asked to go off and do your professional work in your universities, and the fact that you say, I'm going to go off and go do my scholar research, which is creating art, you often say, I need, about, I need six to eight weeks, right? The people from the music department say, hey, two days in and out, going to go play the Chicago Symphony, and then I'm back. Got her done, all right? We have to advocate for the time that it takes to get this stuff done. We have to advocate that in order to do this kind of work in a university setting, three hours a night, seven to 10, ain't gonna cut it. It's actually, it's, it's not mirroring 
the professional experience that you're trying to get your students ready for. It becomes false creation. I had to be more of an authoritative director to, to get this ship to port than I'm comfortable with. We got a lot done. I told you about some great successes. But that's a part that even, I've done this process over and over and over and over again. And we still find ourselves, because all the, the prime directive is necessity being the mother invention and we gotta get this show up. But what did we miss because we skipped the process? I was missing my posse. I was missing all those people that are willing to keep their weight and their head shaved and all that other stuff for the show, right? They had buy-in. I was missing them when I'm, when it ain't working and I'm out of ideas. Now with my own company, I had ideas to say, hey, let's, let's stop, we'll start again tomorrow morning. Well, I didn't have that luxury there because there was no tomorrow morning. There was just the three hours there. There was just the here and now. And so I, I, I believe in myself. I trusted myself, but I wanted to be able to trust others in the room to get something done. And that, for me, was, I feel, a failure on my part as a mentor. And that, that's something that I want to continue to, to grow. I think we all know what it means to work with young actors, and I, I, I actually don't see this as a negative, it just is. And, and I want us to accept that, and, and again, as I said before, find, find what is right about them, find what is their virtue, and grab that, and use that instrument. So once again, I'm now, luckily some of my company members did did brave traffic and came up and saw the show. But now we, what we discovered there is lost to the ethers. We have these depictions, but they, they are what we are. We all know what it's like to watch a show on video. Hi, everybody back there. My, my mom's watching from Santa Cruz, California. Uh, so here's what I just want to leave you with, know your goals and speak them loudly. Write them in the, on a piece of paper in the rehearsal room so that everyone knows why you're there, including administrators, from the moment that you get the opportunity to develop in a university setting. And, and you, you may need to state this time around, what comes first, the art or the ensemble ideals? And if you have to say the ensemble ideals, figure out, well, what is the culminating event then? Because it's going to look different. How can you make that a success? a showing, bits and pieces. But if the university has a season and you're part of their season, it's real, it's art. It can't be half-assed. And you gotta get that ship to port. I just wanna find new ways of getting the ship to port in the way, the, the very reason that we started Looking Glass, because we wanted to get it there with everyone there. We wanted everyone to get there and say, yay, we did it. And why is that important? Because we are showing an example of the very why must this story be told in our ensemble that we are expressing a group of people that are changed, charged, and empowered. And the characters they are playing 
if we get the dramatic arc right, are changed, charged, and empowered. And then the ensemble that the, the audience that you invite in to be part of that ensemble, I would never stage this here where there's a railing there. I'm not, are you guys going to rush the stage at the end of this? Or, I, yeah, don't do theater like this, um, unless you mean to. How can we make the audience feel like they are part of the ensemble? Make sure there's tons of communication, not just with the, the person that hired you or, or if you are of that university, your chair, but make sure that the provost, the dean, understand what you are trying to do, that this isn't same old, same old. This is a different experience. And then finally, be open to and respond to what's in front of you. There are no caveats. Stop with the would have, should have, could haves. Those, that football player who is a offensive end, he played my Nemo. His gift is he's used to getting pounded and getting back up. And, and I, got to, I got to use that, that superhero quality. That was his thing, right? I, I, I was able to appropriate that and, and say, this is what we need in the theater. Erin Axe, she, as I said, she's, she's, she's in the STEM program there. She's brilliant, and she was able to bring that brilliance to her character. That was right. That was her virtue. And how, and how can we make that? That's her. That's why she gets to be in the hall of super friends. So, uh, what are you guys feeling like? Do you want to, you want to do a demonstration? You want to do another demonstration thing or you want to talk? You want to get up and move or you want to talk? I'm game for it either. Okay, get up. Here, let me show you one thing we did. Anybody can do this. Um, can, we, can we pull the, you can, we're done with the video. I'll just need audio. Okay, so I'm going to do an exercise with you, and this is one way we dealt with the fact that you can't talk to people underwater. So this is a game, and this is, this is a combination of exercises that uh, our company stole from Palabolus. And, um, and then just stuff that the students made up. So I, I need at least eight people to come up here, but it could be more. Yeah, come up on stage. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, so has anyone ever done um, Palabolus's flocking? You done flocking? We did it on Friday. Oh, good. But then I'm going to show you how we take flocking and we take it to the next step. So, for those that haven't seen flocking, um, can we raise the, the screen? Do I do it over here? Oh, you got it. Oh, that's weird. Okay, great. So blocking, um, for those that haven't seen it, is there anyone who hasn't seen blocking? If not, you block this you all saw it. Great, good, okay. So just once again, um, this is how uh, we use it. So I get three feet, thank you. See, good ensemble members. Uh, can I get three people behind me? Two on one side and one in the back. Okay, so, no. okay. so once it's blocking, the idea is that we're imagining a mirror in front of us. And so if I start in a neutral position and I move a bit, 
They all move with me. And I just trust that they're following me. Right? And if I locomote, they will locomote with me. Do what they want to do it, right? But if I pivot more than 90 degrees with four people, we have a new leader. So you are three different creatures needing to communicate to each other. So you would need to communicate to this group, you need to communicate to this group, you need to communicate to all three. You are all exploring the water together. But we have three different characters, nine people playing three different characters. You need, stuff's going to happen. You are going to respond to each other. You might enjoy each other's company. You might be terrified of each other's company. You might want to warn one person of the other person. Use physical communication to get that done. So when you, when you switch, that, the, the, the new leader will be the new communicator. We're going to start with silence, and then uh, I'm going to add some, uh, uh, some music that still has some sound. Uh, Great, so starting in a neutral position, first just explore the space. First just, you can first, yeah, explore the space, good. And as you're exploring the space, when you naturally feel that an interaction can occur, you can acknowledge the existence of the other characters in this underwater world. So the other group of three start to communicate with them. How can you give them specific information what do you want to say to them? How do you feel about what is occurring right now?
Lights from taverns and bars They blot out all the stars All we hear are the jeers from within One day seas will rise, one day fire will come One day life will be Yay. So let's, um, uh, why don't you, if you can, come closer, or let's come closer, let's talk about, I'm just, I am curious about your response, I'm curious about your, your own explorations with your students, I'm curious about your ensemble, your longevity of the ensemble. And the name of, of, of this symposium, this intersection between universities and our ensemble. Is this fruitful? Is, is, this, is this a necessity because right now universities function to be the patron for us as artists because we are not, we're not set up in a culture that supports its artists 100%. So we rely on our universities to be our patrons. What about all this? Well, this is, uh, thank you for this, because this is a kind of I'm going to place it here. This is great right now. Um, and I think more than anything, it's the uh, resources that the university has in uh, us space. Uh, students. resources that the university um, employed uh, has for the kind of company uh, that cuts down on the amount of the attractive company. Yeah. Um, so that is that's something that is attractive to us as a company. Um, but I have a question about transitioning from to
if it, at any point it ever said in collaboration with these. Uh, I'm going to hand you this because my mom's all Sorry. <laughs> It's just that any time I've I ever try to talk about it, and even in this setting, I find myself not really wanting to name it or say what it is because I feel weird about it. I feel like, oh, I'm trying to like say, like, oh, I was part of that. So if the, the, the artist at the time or in the publishing of the first edition or at any point could have just said, in collaboration, created in collaboration with, I would be totally satisfied. I don't need money or anything, I'm just very proud to have been part of a process that I never, we ne those of us that were there in the workshops at NYU that created something, like we, we never got that acknowledgement. So just on that level, I just want, it's, it rem it's reminded me of the, I was like, oh yeah, I've had this feeling and that would be really all I would, I would love to just have that. Yeah. Can you just say, Dave? In terms of how you, you work this out with the students, you guys are going to do this with Looking Glass now. Are, are you going to? Did you script it? I mean, do you take authorship when you when when you guys do it? With this, with this specific piece, um, I did come in with a script that I'd been working on for two years. There were at least the 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 the. There was visual text, there was physical text that the students helped create. With this one process, it, there was less spoken text that, that they helped create. But that's my issue. Text is text. And I don't think we figure, I don't think we as artists have figured out a way to honor those, I mean, that, that, the, the other text, visual text, topographical text. We haven't figured out how to honor those that help us create that. In the beginning, Looking Glass used to say whoever was the writer and the ensemble critic. We don't do that anymore. I, 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 maybe it just doesn't look good on the, on the marketing. I, I don't know. Uh, yeah, that's one of the things that I was going to say. Um, working with our ensemble, we have like a kind of like Frantic Assembly. We have three directors who, who direct in different capacities and stuff. And we do devise with our ensemble. And the thing that we've started to approach is because my ties to technology is like when you go see a movie, there's so many people that are involved in just the look of Iron Man. And they acknowledge that at the end of the movie. And so every person who programmed one line of code is <laughs> mentioned or thanked. But the problem is, is that when you go to publicist or you know, to put out a thing, you can't say this 15 page thing because all of press is worried about number of letters and how many words. So it always comes back to there's one of us that has to be this head person who gets all of that press and everything. But it is such a collaborative thing when it's still it's still hard for us to navigate. And I think that breaking it down and, and just doing this in collaboration with, you know, either physical collaboration or, you know, technolo technological collaboration, that's at least how we've been starting to approach it. And I think that that helps. We experimented at Looking Glass with, actually with the show that I directed, uh, The Last Act of Look Cadison, where I really needed to, I'd been writing it for some time and I needed to switch to being a director. Uh, I had we I had been co-writing with and the the co-writer before th we produced it she she died and so we brought even more names so by the time we were done there were five writers on the byline well we felt good about doing that but then had to spend so much time communicating to Chris Jones and everyone else that this wasn't a nothing bad occurred right it's not that someone couldn't get the job done, it's that this is, this is how we create it this time around. And so it's interesting how the outside world views that kind of acknowledgement. Thanks. Uh, I thought to add a thought and a question. Um, so I have a devised theater company here in Chicago, and we, don't, we haven't had the opportunity yet to work with a university residency, but um, we audition and we have many workshop phases to the to the creative process most of those people are coming out just out of undergrad or you know very very young 
And um, because some of those shows now have started to tour, we have just come up with a blanket, probably similar to what you guys did early days, um, originally devised by. And anybody who is a part of the workshop process from a designer to a movement director to an actual actor on the stage uh, type of divisor is just listed. And we just, we just go to bat for that when we go on tour with whoever we go. We say, you, this 20 person list has to be on the program, originally devised by and everybody has to be in there. So I can't really speak, because I don't know if in what way that would be useful to list all the university, you know, and yeah, and, and everyone who wrote a piece of code or something. I don't, I don't know. I know for us it's useful because it's usually around 20 people. So we can sort of manage that. Um, but I think that that's, and that's written into the contract, and we sort of st stole this from Cirque du Soleil, that if anything that's created, the company owns, and the company will receive the financial benefits, essentially, of tours, other than if you go on the tour and the company's paying you for your time and your work on tour. But so in that way, it's really hopefully, you know, resolving that situation for us that, and actually it's because I had read about Superman and for years the two guys who created, two kids from Cleveland that, from high school that created Superman were robbed blind because of the rules in those days that they're, so they're, not only were they not paid for their work, but their names were never listed as the original creators of Superman, right? Which has made trillions and who knows how many dollars, right? So anyway, that's, that's, that was my thought. My question just is, um, with this August retreat and the black and white smoke, um, I was curious to know how many, I mean, you guys have such a large ensemble, um, and I just work so differently. I really am, am the lead person who just brings in one idea every two years, and we just work on that. How many of these types of processes, either with universities or not with universities, are, uh, occur roughly each year and are brought to the table and then are sort of tabled? Because, you know, if, if, if you could give me a sort of rough estimate of how that number works. Thank you. Sure, and I'm also mindful that it's lunchtime, so I will, I'll stop. So it's a great question. Uh, we're, we are a company of creator artists. So everybody comes to the table with something. Uh, and we used to have three week, we used to spend a month doing this. Now we have five, six days. And we also have to deal with membership and approve the budget and there's a lot of other stuff. So we have given agency to our artistic leadership to pare down all the proposals to six to nine, top, top. We also are this year possibly moving to deciding two seasons at a time. At the very least, we are deciding the opening show of the following season, because we were just finding we just weren't able to raise the dollars in t for sponsorship and, and just weren't able to do the design process and the collaboration that we needed to get that opening show of the following season. So we're about to experiment with that. The, the good news about that is more people get a yes. The bad news is those that get a no have to wait even longer. And we do have a, we have, uh, we're now 25 members, and so that's, that's, that's a tough one. And half of our company are, are, are directors. So there's, the way that we participate now more often is to direct, and so there's less of an opportunity to be part of the ensemble. So we're looking for new ways to function and collaborate. Uh, I'll, I'll be around and happy to talk to any of you. Please contact me. My information is just Google me and you can contact me, um, find me. I, I am, would love to hear how you're getting, all getting this done and figuring out how, because we, we're still trying to figure it out <laughs> and, and, and remain an ensemble-based company and, and not give 
uh, not just become an institution like like seems to be happening. So, yay, everybody, yay. <laughs> <laughs>